In 2025, businesses will certainly continue to experiment with generative AI in ways that may reshape how many organizations operate. But beyond the headlines and hype, what are the real trends in artificial intelligence that matter? In this video, we've asked Thomas Davenport and Randy Bean to break down the top issues around AI today. They draw from their latest MIT Sloan Management Review article, Five Trends in AI and Data Science for 2025. This isn't about predicting the future. These shifts are already in motion. From the emergence of agenic AI to the difficult challenges measuring the ROI of these technologies, these insights are grounded in new research and expert analysis. In the next few minutes, Tom and Randy will break down which trends leaders need to pay attention to this year and beyond. We predict that in 2025, one of the biggest trends will be agentic AI. There is, of course, a very high degree of hype around this subject, um, but also, I think, some actual promise. So um, 2025 will reveal which is which. Agents are um, AI capabilities that actually do something, perform a transaction, uh, uh, summarize a document, uh, rather than just informing us after a prompt. And um, the general consensus of how agents will work is that there will be lots and lots of them. They will um, be generally small um, in the functionality they provide to perform a fairly narrow task, but can be combined to perform much larger workflows and even broad business processes. And um, they will use AI, but not only generative AI. One other attribute that I think is the primary driver for a lot of organizations is there will be a need for less human intervention. However, we're quite confident that there will be still a need for human review, um, particularly for generative AI. These will still be predictive systems that predict the next word, and sometimes the next word or the next action will be incorrect. Someone said to me, in a head of AI at an insurance company, that maybe we'll do um, reserving your vacation time or something like that, that, that that won't bring the company down if it goes wrong. Eventually, maybe we'll move to you know, billing and claims and underwriting and those uh, much more business critical tasks. Right now, I think the key is to start experimenting and see which types of agents might be useful to your organization and how they might work for you. The second trend that we highlight in our piece is the time has come to measure results from generative AI experiments. For most organizations, based upon the survey that have been conducting since 2012 and released earlier this year, they're still at an early stage. So roughly 75% um, of organizations still said they were at the stage of experimentation, testing, planning, and design. And only 23.9% had implemented in limited production. But it's always important to measure the results of any type of data and AI investments. Often I speak to audiences and trying to make the point, I say, if you're not getting measure measurable value from your data and AI investments, you should take a serious look at shutting them down this afternoon. You know, it's Michael Bloomberg who always said, measure, measure, measure. So the time has come for organizations to do that measurement in terms of their experimental AI activities um, and measure the value that they're deriving. The third point in our friends article was that the reality about data-driven culture is setting in. So it's important to understand that organizational adoption resulting from AI is steady but gradual for most organizations. And one of the reasons why, so when you think about it, 90% of Fortune 1000 companies are legacy companies. In other words, they're older than a generation. So they can't be like Facebook, Meta, and move fast and break things. They can't afford to break things. They need to move at a cautious pace. They need to establish the safeguards and the guardrails for successful and responsible adoption of AI. 
So in the survey that I've been conducting, one of the questions we ask each year is what is the principal challenge to becoming AI driven or data driven? And roughly 91% of respondents this year said it was the cultural challenges with the greatest impediment. The process of becoming data and AI driven is something that continues to be a challenge and that the major challenge is really about people, process, change management, transformation. The fourth trend we want to discuss for 2025 is that unstructured data is important again. And this is a big pivot. Um, for the last 30 years or so, at least, organizations have focused on managing um, structured data, rows and columns of numbers. But generative AI uses unstructured data, you know, text and images and voices and all sorts of things that, you know, don't come in rows and columns of numbers naturally. And so if we're going to be successful with managing um, that unstructured data for generative AI, we have to curate, baby curate. <laughs> we have to improve that data. We have to select what's most important about it. Um, it was Jeff McMillan at Morgan Stanley, one of the early adopters of this um, approach said, Generative AI does not solve your unstructured data integration problem. So you have to tell it which is the best proposal, which is the best policy document, and that requires human involvement. Now, we can get some help from generative AI. It's quite good at summarizing and categorizing documents and so on, but it's not going to tell you which is most supportive of your business strategy, and that's where the humans need to come in. Okay, trend number five in our survey is who should run data and AI expect continue to struggle. This is something that we have a slight divergence of opinion. Uh, many organizations are facing the challenge of where data and AI should sit within their organization. AI leadership roles and data leadership roles are relatively nascent. So we'd love to hear your perspective, Tom. Well, I think your survey suggests that um, not all is great in the world of, of data leadership. A number of people think that the chief data officer role is not well established and functioning terribly well. I would argue we have too many tech chiefs. We've got chief data officers, chief information officers, chief analytics officers, chief technology officers, chief digital officers, chief information security officers. The world of customers for these functions is very confused. They don't know where one job starts and the other ends. And so my idea for addressing this, and it turns out a lot of organizations are doing it already, was to create these sort of um, super tech leader roles. Many of them are called chief information officers, um, but that they have overall responsibility for all technology-oriented functions and that chief data and analytics or AI officer reports to that person who would report to the CEO. It's just not pragmatic to suggest that you'd have seven or eight different tech leaders all reporting to the CEO. Let me, let me fill in with some of the data from the survey uh, relative to the points that Tom made and then share my perspective. So one of the things that we asked is whether the CDO, CDAO, CAI role is very successful and well-established within your organization. And 47.6% said yes, so a majority feel that it's not um, well-established. We also asked whether these roles are well understood within the organization and 51.3 said yes, so about half feel that they're not well understood. So the question is where should the uh, role reside within the organization. Traditionally, when, after, when the chief data officer and chief data and analytics officer role was first established, it largely sat under the CIO. But in the past decade, many of these roles moved out from under the CIO to be a peer role. One of the things that are seeing now is that these roles are moving out of the technology organization and into the business organization. So although in this year's survey, 47 percent said they still reported into the technology organization this year. 36 percent, the largest percentage ever, said that they reported to business leadership, specifically the CEO, the president, or the chief operating officer. I've come to the 
personal belief that these roles are best situated within the business organization. I think it's important to point out that all of these issues are quite contextual, but I think it depends very much on you know, what are the capabilities of the people to whom they report. If a CIO can't spell data or analytics, clearly it's not going to make a lot of sense for the chief data and analytics officer to report to them. On the other hand, I think um, some of the people that I interviewed for this um, report that I did on too many chiefs, people like um, Sastri Darussala at TIAA or Shamin Mohammed at CarMax or Sean McCormack at First Student, these are business executives. They all report to the CEO. They, um, as you suggested, they make it their responsibility to help business people be successful. And, you know, I think we largely agree. I think it's a matter of um, degree. You know, I just had one additional point and highlight that I think that the um, composition of the chief AI officer or chief data officer continues to evolve. And I'd make two points to illustrate this. One is uh, conducted a um, panel discussion this summer um, on the campus or in the general proximity to MIT. And I had on my chief data officer panel, Amy Lenander, who's the new and current chief data officer for Capital One. What's interesting is that Amy's background, her previous role was she was president of Capital One UK for five years. So she didn't come from a data architecture, a data engineering, an analytics, algorithm type of background. She came from running an end-to-end -end business. And the other example of that is Bob Hedges from Visa, who had been a line executive running retail banking for Fleet Bank, running personal investments for Fidelity Investments. And he became chief data officer at Visa. So I think many different approaches work, um, and it's an evolving space. And I would agree that uh, increasingly um, it's a good idea to have whoever your tech leaders are, have them rotate in and out of mm -hmm. business and tech-oriented functions so that they have a balanced perspective on the, on the two issues. So maybe we should end on that, that area of agreement. Yeah, that wasn't so bad. We thought this was going to be uh, feisty and we came to agreement. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for watching. We hope you've enjoyed Tom and Randy's discussion. For a deeper dive into these trends, their full article is available at the MIT Sloan Management Review website. For more interviews with our authors, check out this playlist. We'll see you in the next video.